change in changing universities from in a short while. So here we have a, a quick outline. I'm going to uh, talk about the roots of Poincaré's uh, conventionalist stance on uh, the problem of space, a uh, well-known problem of the latter 19, uh, half of the 19th century. And then I'm going to talk briefly about how uh, Poincaré discovered uh, the Lorentz group, or what we call today actually the Poincaré group, the larger group than the Lorentz group. Then I come to the heart of the, the matter of the role of wireless technology in Poincaré's discovery of the phys physical meaning of the Lorentz group. And then how this, uh, this change in his understanding of the physical meaning of the Lorentz group uh, led to his further uh, invention of uh, what I call space-time conventionalism. So I'll give you um, a few technical details here, but most of uh, the details and references can be found in a publication of uh, August last year in Studies in History and Philosophy of Modern Physics, of which you can find a uh, copy online in my homepage at the University of Lorraine. So here we go. The, uh, the origins of, uh, of Poincaré's conventionalism. First, there's uh, Poincaré's, uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Poincaré's uh, philosophy, conventionalist philosophy, you have, he begins with uh, geometrical conventionalism. So here we have in fact, the very beginnings of at least historical traces that we have of geometrical conventionalism uh, for Poincaré. Uh, there's a, there's a well-known passage in his uh, first uh, collection of philosophical writings, La science et l'hypothèse, uh, which actually goes back to his first big discovery in mathematics, discovery of Fuchsian functions, where he, uh, he proved the existence of Fuchsian functions using a reference to hyperbolic geometry. And here we have then on the left, this is a, a Poincaré disk, of course, which is then a model of hyper, hyperbolic geometry, or at least a region of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, this is uh, something that appears in the, the first supplement to his uh, prize memoir for the Grand Prix des Sciences Mathematiques, that's a G GPSM, on Fuchsian functions, which, is, which then I published with, um, with my colleague Jeremy Gray in 1997. You can also find, find that publication on my homepage. So uh, this is the, uh, the point that he made there was that pseudo-geometry, uh, actually what he meant to say was hyperbolic geometry, the word didn't exist yet, but uh, will provide us with a convenient language for expressing what we'll have to say about the Fuchsian group. And how does that work? Well, he just set up this translation dictionary. This is, how, this is of course, how we go about making models, right? So you have uh, in this translation dictionary that, that Poincaré set up, you have what we call now a circle, in Euclidean geometry is also a circle in uh, hyperbolic geometry. An angle is an angle. This is a conformal model. Uh, and then a straight line, however, in uh, Euclidean geometry uh, corresponds to an arc that cuts the, the limit circle here orthogonally. So uh, I'll get my pointer out. So here you have the limit circle. So these, these are actually straight lines. These arcs are now, in this model, straight line because they, they intersect the limit uh, circle orthogonally, All right? And then distance then would be a log of a, a cross ratio. So you can see this, uh, you can actually see uh, a, the intersection of these straight lines would be a hyperbolic triangle. So you have the basis of uh, a way of mapping um, Euclidean geometry in this model to uh, hyperbolic geometry. And this is the basis then of uh, Poincaré's uh, development of conventionalist, uh, conventionalist inter interpretation of uh, geometry. So then he moved in from uh, geometry to say, well, in fact, geometry is an abstract science. And yet we talk about the, the, uh, the geometry of space, of phenomenal space, as if uh, we knew what it was. And uh, Poincaré had a different take on this, which was rather con controversial and not well accepted during his lifetime. Because, uh, in fact, his position was that there is no fact to the matter of the geometry of physical space because geometry and physics form a couple. Now, this is, wasn't this, uh, original, an original point of view. Helmholtz had essentially said the same, same thing already as early as 1876, or maybe even earlier than that. But uh, Poincaré pointed out after Helmholtz died in 1894 that uh, for him, uh, Helmholtz did not make it sufficiently clear that there is no empirical foundation uh, of geometry. 
Right? The idea is that you have to assign some kind of physical process to a geometrical object like a straight line. Right? You have to say, well, this is the, this is the uh, axis of rotation of a, of a rotating body or the uh, propagation direction of a, of a light wave or something like that. You have to make a stipulation of some kind of physical uh, process to uh, connect it to uh, an, an object, an abstract geometric object, and that's always going to be uh, um, our choice. It will also always be a stipulation. Uh, at the time, however, a few uh, scientists were convinced. There, are, there were a handful of uh, scientists who, who were convinced by uh, Poincaré's arguments, including the uh, ast astronomer uh, uh, Hugo von Seliger, uh, the uh, mathematician Felix Hausdorff, the uh, Belgian mathematical physicist Théophile de Donder, and uh, another Belgian uh, mathematician uh, de la Vallée Poussin. But in general, uh, neither mathematicians nor physicists agreed with this point of view. Uh, this brings us then to Einstein. So we jump from Poinc um, Poincaré's conventionalist philosophy of space to Einstein. It might see a little, seem a little abrupt. abrupt. Uh, however, the point here is that uh, special relativity uh, challenged uh, this conventionalist view. Uh, not directly at first, but uh, very soon you'll see that there, there was a direct challenge between Einsteinian relativity and Poincaré's conventionalist philosophy. Uh, and this, so this just uh, recalls the basis of Einstein's uh, view of uh, relativity based on his two postulates of relativity and the idea that velocity and light is a universal uh, constant in vacuum. He derives what we know as the Lorentz transformations from kinematic assumptions. Uh, and he observes that the uh, Lorentz transformation preserves the form of this light sphere equation. In fact, it preserves the, uh, uh, the light sphere uh, uh, found the propagation of light uh, equation, differential equation for the propagation of light, such that you have x squared uh, plus y squared plus c squared plus ct squared. It transforms directly into the same form. Right? So this, is, this is something that he, he put out in 1905 to convince his readers that indeed these two postulates were compatible. It was not immediately ob uh, obvious that that was so. Poincaré then uh, drew some c consequences from uh, from his theory of relativity, which I'll go into the details in a minute, um, but obviously there was a consequent which concerned measurement. So this is, this, is a, this is a direct quotation from Poincaré's long memoir published in the Rondi Conti di Palermo in 1906, uh, but actually written in July of 1905 with the title of On the Dynamics of the Electron. How do we go about measuring? The first response will be we transport objects considered to be invariable solids, one on top of the other. But that is no longer true in the current theory. If we admit the Lorentzian contraction in this theory, two lengths are equal by definition if they are spanned by light in equal time. So this Lorentzian contraction, you, you recall, this is the, uh, the hypothesis that Fitzgerald and Lorentz came about in order to explain the Michaels and Morley null result uh, of the ether drift experiment, saying that all bodies are contracted by a, a certain amount in the direction of their motion, which was an immediate explanation then of uh, this null result. Pardon? Um, that's a good question. In, for Poincaré, in this particular memoir, uh, all his, uh, all his uh, remarks uh, concern a single frame. He used, he used active, active Lorentz proofs at that point. It was also rather unusual. So the idea here is that, in fact, Poincaré retained uh, what we know as Galilean kinematics. He abandoned the notions of rigid bodies in order to accommodate Lorentz contraction. That is, all bodies in motion must uh, uh, undergo some sort of contraction in order to obey the Lorentz transformations. Otherwise, he agreed with uh, Einstein's point, material bodies contract when accelerated. For Einstein, a spherical light wave, as I said, is spherical in all inertial frames. What about Poincaré? What did he have to say about this? This is what we're going to look at now. Uh, very soon, Poincaré uh, explained exactly what happened to the role of light waves in his theory. In fact, light waves are not deformed like solids in the Michelson-Morley experiment. This is, this is a crucial point for him. Uh, this is, and so in an uh, in article he published in 1907 entitled The Relativity of Space, which really took this uh, uh, question to heart, he said the following, if light wave fronts deformed like material bodies, we would not have noticed 
the Lorentz Fitzgerald deformation. Right? So this is actually a consequence for him. He says, obviously, and the only reason that we would have noticed uh, Lorentz Fitzgerald deformation is, is that it's because light does not behave like material bodies. He went into this uh, a little bit further in uh, his lectures at the Sorbonne. He, he held the chair of, uh, of celestial mechanics and theoretical astronomy at the Sorbonne from 1896. And his lectures then uh, in that year, 1906, 1907, addressed his latest discovery, which happened to be a uh, theory of relativity. And then the, the, this course is called On the Limits of Newton's Laws. And in these uh, lectures, which were published in 1953, but in a, in a bastardized version, and uh, a couple years ago, we rediscovered the manuscript of the student notes. So now we have actually uh, access to the, to the student notes of 1906 of uh, a, a, a student of uh, this course, Henri Vergne. And so we actually know what, uh, at least what the student uh, uh, understood from these lectures. And so in these, uh, in these notes, there's a discussion of the locus of light as judged by observers at rest with respect to the ether with flying rods. Now, obviously, from Point Grey's point of view, if you have flying rods, which is to say rods in uniform motion, they must be contracted. So the idea is to measure a light wave front with flying rods. Not an easy thing to do, I'll grant you. However, this is, this is uh, how uh, Poincaré wanted to explain the kinematics of relativity to his, uh, his students. Uh, so you can see already, it's rather strange. We have uh, a mix of kin kinematic uh, attributes, real and apparent in his language, re the relating phenomena in different inertial frames. So where did this view come from? Well, um, we could go back as far as uh, uh, 1895 when Lorentz published a uh, uh, large memoir uh, on the electron theory, on his electron theory, where he, inter he introduced this uh, quantity that he called Ortszeit, which was translated a little bit later into French as uh, temps local and in uh, English as local time, so it's fairly direct. However, uh, I should emphasize here that for Lorentz, this was not a physical quantity. This was a mathematical um, expression that uh, actually allowed him to uh, express Maxwell's equations in a moving frame, which was not supposed to be accessible physically. Uh, the same uh, expression for T prime here was, was uh, proposed earlier by uh, Vogt in an in optical setting, but uh, nevertheless, uh, certainly, uh, it's largely um, associated now with, uh, with Lawrence. So Poincaré was familiar with this work, of course. He had lectured on uh, Lawrence's theory and also Larmor's electron theory in 1899. He observed in 1900 that Lawrence's local time is measured to first order in uh, velocity of uh, the frame over the velocity of light by light synchronized clocks uh, at relative rest in a frame in uniform motion with respect to the ether by observers who absorb, uh, ignore their motion. So this is actually a way that, uh, that you can uh, physically interpret. This is an operational, what we call an operational definition of local time. And so for the first time now, Lorentz is, Lorentz's Ortszeit, uh, or lo uh, temps local, is actually given a physical interpretation. So this actually renders Lorentz's theory a, a candidate for physical reality. Before then, obviously, there was no way uh, to attach uh, measured values in a moving frame uh, to the theory because it simply did not exist. Now, uh, this, of course, is, um, was something that, that Poincaré uh, would go on to develop later. His interpretation of the local time is what I want to insist on, uh, underwent significant change then in the wake of relativity theory. Here, because here we're still in, uh, in 1900. Uh, we have five more years until relativity theory will come around. <coughs> so uh, in 1904, well, actually in 1899 and also in 1904, Lorentz published his transformations, which however were in a form that uh, we don't recognize them today because they were, it was a, comp uh, a composite uh, transformation. You have, uh, this is how he, well, I think this is exactly how he wrote them actually. So you have x, y, and z prime, and uh, T prime, which is close to what we saw earlier, uh, a little bit different, uh, with beta uh, defined as one over uh, one minus z squared, uh, t squared. L is some uh, function of velocity, 
<coughs> and see the uh, propagation of oscillant light. And the idea is then is that you compose this transformation with a Galilean transformation, and that gives you uh, what we know as the lens transformations. Right, so the problem was then, how do you interpret these particular uh, um, values of the transformations of coordinates? Well, Poincaré comes around, he will give us uh, his interpretation, which will then be what we know as the Lorentz transformation. Uh, we actually know a little bit more about how Poincaré did this uh, because there's a correspondence between Poincaré and, and Lorentz which dates from uh, March to July of 1905 in which uh, Poincaré dis uh, communicates his discovery to, to Lorentz. Uh, and also we have, we have now research notes of Poincaré that date from the same period. So we have uh, a, a fairly detailed account of Poincaré's discovery of the Lorentz group, where, whereas for Einstein we have practically nothing. We have uh, a few letters, but we have no research notes. So uh, fr from a historical point of view, we know a lot more about how Poincaré discovered the Lorentz group than we know about how Einstein came about discover his theory. Anyways, uh, so from the, from the research notes, we know that there, there are uh, a couple references. here. One of them is to Lorentz's paper that I just referred to, and to what, he, what Poincaré called Langevin's brochure, which appears to be a paper that he published in March of 1905 in the Journal de Physique. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly clear reference. So the, uh, the manuscript that we have from this period covers the key points of the, uh, this longer memoir, the dynamics of the electron, except for a couple of points, uh, Lie algebra and uh, the law of gravitation. So this is something we, uh, we don't have uh, any manuscript uh, data on that. Um, well then, and we also have then, uh, this is actually also found in the correspondence between, uh, between Lorentz, I'm sorry, and Poincaré, and how he justifies the Lorentz group uh, using that what is now a classical method of taking three frames, uh, K0, K1, and K2, and then you pass directly from K0 to K2 via the, the velocity law. Uh, so that's in the letter from Poincaré de Lorentz. In the, in the notes, we also have the derivation from the infinitesimal uh, Lie group generators. These, of course, provide Poincaré directly with the velocity transformations for them, so he just reads off the velocity transformations from the Lie group generators. Very easy for him. So now that, that gives us the Lorentz group. Uh, what about the, uh, the physical interpretation or the kinematical interpretation? Well, light length, as we saw earlier, was supposed to be measured by light time of flight. And so here we have uh, first uh, an indication of what, uh, uh, how Poincaré thought about this. This is not Poincaré, this is actually that uh, article from the uh, Journal de Physique that I mentioned for, by Paul Langevin, uh, where there's a, this, is a, this is just a scan of the of the uh, illustration in of what he called velocity waves. So you imagine this point here is a moving electron and these velocity waves are then being uh, emitted from the moving electron which is moving from left to right, right? So we have some uh, a a sequence of spheres. So when uh, Poincaré actually uh, publishes his uh, short note which is a um, a uh, resume of the longer publication, the Monte Conti, uh, he then expresses uh, the principle of relativity as the form invariance of the laws of uh, physics with respect to a certain transformation in space and time coordinates. And of course, that would be the Lorentz group. Uh, and he notes that the Lorentz trans transformation leaves invariant the quadratic form x squared y squared plus z squared plus u squared, where u is equal to ct times the square root of minus one, suggesting then a new four-dimensional vector space. He also uses this space then to, uh, to write the two first uh, laws of uh, gravitational interaction that are Lorentz covariant, uh, using the, then uh, the invariance that he's, that he's extracted from this four-dimensional vector space. This is what he's done, this is clear, there's no, there's no uh, question about this. There, what he is uh, less clear on is uh, what happens to clocks in motion. This is something that Einstein was, was of course, put at the forefront of his, his paper, and it's rather curious that, well, at least from our point of view, that uh, Poincaré does not address this. However, what we read in these uh, newly found uh, manuscript notes of Henri Vergne from the Sorbonne lectures is the following. So this is, this is, uh, this is taken directly from the, uh, the Vernia notebook. Uh, <coughs> I'll just read it to you. So Lorentz assumes that all bodies undergo a contraction in the direction of motion proportional to the square velocity. Lengths are then altered, 
and durations are altered by the impossibility of setting watches truly, such that the apparent velocity of light is constant. Then we perform a Lorentz transformation. The Lorentz transformations must form a group such that we have identically then this, uh, this equivalence. So this is, this is the, sa so the same uh, light sphere uh, equation that we saw uh, with Einstein. However, we have clearly have a problem here with clocks in motion. So uh, Poincaré, in the same, uh, the same lectures at the Sorbonne, uh, then explains how we can understand light propagation with the same idea of these concentric spheres, right? So you can see that it's cl this is clearly related to, at least uh, uh, diagrammatically, to Langevin's publication of March 1905, where you have uh, a source of light that's moving from O to B. And then, uh, then O is the center of the larger sphere, and A the second or second sphere, and then uh, there's no sphere yet for B. Poincaré then uh, introduces this light ellipse. Now this is, this is supposed to be the, uh, the shape of the light wave front, right? You say, well, how do you get from a sphere to an ellipse? Well, this is how you do it. Uh, and this, this, uh, this diagram actually appears in, uh, in the manuscript notes. I've added uh, the uh, H and A points here just for, uh, so it's understandable. Uh, so what you have, it's obvious that if, if this is supposed to represent a light wave front, well, we're, we're taking a meridional cross-section, right? So that gives us an ellipse. Uh, the distance from O to H is just then uh, the propagation velocity of light times uh, a, a certain time, a period of time. So this is just the, well, we saw, okay, uh, it's just a, a duration for a propagation of light from two between two points. However, what we have in the longitudinal direction is uh, alpha times so that's going to be longer because we've defined alpha with respect to this Lorentz factor. So that's why you don't have a circle. Now we have an ellipse uh, with the like eccentricity expressed like so and uh, the focus uh, located at alpha vt so that the apparent displacement is x prime is equal to fp. So this actually, this diagram is, is rather, uh, rather uh, amazing. It allows you to uh, derive with these uh, values, uh, the Lorentz transformation. So, okay, well, you can see why Poincaré would use that in a uh, lecture for his students, because he's trying to give them an idea of how to interpret the, uh, the Lorentz transformation with respect to light and uh, to uh, moving rods, right? There's, in fact, there's no clocks here. All clocks are at rest, so you don't have any moving clocks. Uh, so essentially, the uh, the point of view that he that he presented at the Sorbonne, he published in 1908. There's very little difference between uh, the uh, Vernon's notebooks from this uh, Sorbonne lecture and this published version, the Revue Générale des Sciences Pures et Appliquées, uh, also entitled Sur la dynamique de l'électron. Uh, and uh, however, Poincaré insisted on the fact that indeed all inertial frames are equal, which or equivalent, which is something we, we'd expect, I guess, from somebody who believes in the principle of relativity. So this is what he said. Uh, it is impossible to escape the impression that the principle of relativity is a general law of nature that we could never make manifest by any means manageable, anything other than relative motions, by which I mean not just velocities of bodies with respect to, each, to the ether, but velocities of bodies with respect to each other. So this is, the ether, in, in other words, has no special standing here. This is only between uh, inertial reference frames, which is, of course, uh, that doesn't really shock us from a relativistic point of view. You say, well, okay, well, what about then clocks in motion? Well, um, in fact, if you, if we do a little bit of an anachronism here, I say a little bit because space-time diagrams were invented in 1908, and uh, Poincaré's publication was in 1908, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't actually imagine that anyone thought of Poincaré's ellipse in this way in 1908, but just so that um, uh, we can understand what was going on, we who know about uh, space-time diagrams. This then is a Poincaré ellipse. Poincaré's ellipse is measured in constant real time. That is constant uh, true time. That is the, the time of an observer at rest. So it's going to be a space-like hypersurface in constant time. Now it's an ellipse, right? And according, if you take a look at the details, this ellipse is going to go out of the light hypercone. 
So that means that there, the point A in particular is inaccessible to an observer at rest, and yet Poincaré's explanation of the diagram is that it somehow it's accessible. So clearly there's a, there's a problem here in giving a physical interpretation of the, uh, of the light ellipse. However, there are two points that are real. Uh, this point here and this point, this point here actually intersect the light cone. So on the light ellipse, there are two points that are real. They, ha they happen to correspond to then the, uh, just the unaltered, uh, non-contracted distance CT. Now, um, Poincaré's interpretation of the, uh, of the light ellipse changes. It changes sometime between 1908 and 1909. We know it changed in 1909 because we have a lecture that he gave in, uh, in Göttingen at the invitation of Hilbert and the Wolfscale Committee. Hilbert invited Poincaré to deliver the first Wolfscale lectures, named after a donor uh, in Göttingen, uh, in the fall of 1908. Uh, it, it was clear from, that from the circumstances that what uh, Hilbert and his colleagues were setting up was a confrontation between Minkowski, who had actually used uh, Poincaré's four-dimensional vector space uh, to set up his, uh, his famous notion of space-time. Uh, and yet there, was, there were clear differences here. But they'd ne they had never met since, this, uh, since uh, these publications. Uh, and so the idea is that they would meet then in April of 1909. Unfortunately, Minkowski dies of after uh, an attack of appendicitis in January 1909, and so the meeting never happened. And nonetheless, Hilbert asked Poincaré at that point to add a lecture on mathematical physics or astronomy. Poincaré complied with Hilbert's re uh, request and delivered uh, a lecture in French on the new mechanics, what he called the new mechanics. Um, there was, this was also the occasion, with, it was what they called the Poincaré week. It was a Poincaré fest in Göttingen. Uh, mathematicians and physicists came from all around Germany, including Sommerfeld. Max Born was there and took notes. Uh, all kinds of uh, physicists were there to, to see this great occasion for Poincaré. He didn't come so often in Germany. And it was also the occasion for Felix Klein's 60th birthday. Six, Felix Klein being the third professor of mathematical, math, uh, of physics, pardon, in Göttingen. And in the speech that uh, is in the, in the Göttingen archives, uh, Hilbert had this to say. Minkowski uh, has t taught us that the concept of uh, proper time is relative. Uh, this goes all the more for the concept of proper age. Uh, age, in the sense, in, in the only sense uh, in this which is uh, va valid, is not a simple function of time alone. Rather, it's a function of several imponderable elements. So he's, he's making a joke here, but I, this actually attaches then to uh, the uh, the twin paradox, right? Because you're measuring measuring age and uh, and uh, relative time. So this is this is perhaps one of the first uh, sources of this uh, uh, twin paradox. Uh, in other words, but uh, the this actually this joke also had a, had a barb to it because Poincaré had not accepted the concept of proper time. The idea that you, at least in the, in the idea that you would put clocks in motion and, and the reading of clocks in motion would be valid. So uh, what was Poincaré's response then? Well, in his, in his lecture, the last of his lectures on, on the new mechanics, he imagined comparing telemetry data from a system in motion, B, with a velocity of uh, two-thirds of the speed of light with that of a second station, A, in motion with equal and opposite velocity. And so this is, here's what he, how he presented it. A can believe he is at rest, and B's apparent speed will be then 400,000 kilometers per second. If A knows the new mechanics, he will say to himself, B has a speed he cannot attain, so it must be that I too am in motion. It seems he could determine his absolute situation, but he would have to be able to observe B's motion. To make this observation, A and B begin by setting their watches. Then B, begin, then B sends telegrams to A indicating his successive positions. Putting these signals together, A can give an account of B's motion and trace its curve. Well, the signals propagate at the speed of light, the watches marking apparent time vary at every instant and it will all go down as if B's watch were fast. So this is, this is absolutely uh, amazing because it's the first time, one, that Poincaré puts, watch, it puts clocks in motion and how does, he, how does he connect the two? He uses uh, wireless telegraphy which is a very new, uh, as you know, uh, technology in 1909. 
uh, it was only in 1906 that the first uh, Poulsen uh, arc generators were uh, available in order to make continuous wave uh, uh, telegraphic uh, um, signals. All right, so this is something that Poincaré, of course, is very much involved with. He lectured on the Poulsen uh, arc transmitter in 1908. He was very much involved with uh, using the Eiffel Tower to be a uh, transmitter of, uh, of time signals. And so that was, this was actually tested uh, in 1908, in, uh, no, or in 1909, or in March. And in 1910, uh, there was regular uh, time uh, signal transmission from the Eiffel Tower, thanks in part to uh, Poincaré's support at the Bureau de Longitude. The, this story is well told by, um, by Peter Gallus in his book on Einstein clocks and Poincaré's maps. And so here we have, to say this is, uh, this is of course, not nobody had actually uh, yet uh, used <laughs> telegraphic signals to, to uh, telemetry data. However, the idea was in more or less in the air. This is a this is an artist's uh, depiction of this fellow here. Uh, they're they're in the air. They're flying, as you can see that. Uh, and th this is a wireless device. And th notice these are uh, U.S. Army air officers. And so they're obviously surveying the land and signaling back enemy positions to uh, to their home base using wireless uh, wireless communication methods. So this is from 1910. Uh, in the same year, actually, we know from, uh, from the archives that the U.S. Army was actually testing this stuff, and they weren't the only ones. Of course, all the military uh, were interested in using either uh, dirigibles or uh, um, uh, airplanes to, um, to, to use uh, as reconnaissance uh, vehicles. And uh, obviously, if you want to signal uh, position of uh, the enemy or what have you, you need some way of communication. Wireless communication was, was actually there, and it was used. Right, this is this will actually be a, an important technology in World War One, as you know. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I should I should uh, underline the fact that although the idea was there, in fact, <laughs> you could not detect, you could not realize. Uh, well, first of all, nobody could move, could actually. Uh, displace uh, a vehicle with two-thirds the speed of light. Uh, that's one thing. And, and of course, the other aspect is that they didn't have any timekeepers that were, uh, had nanosecond accuracy. So uh, there was a basic problem of, uh, of having extremely accurate timekeepers. Timekeepers at that point had a tenth of a second accuracy. And then the fastest plane, I don't know, could not even go 100 kilometers an hour, maybe. Uh, so they were a long way from actually realizing what we realize today with our, uh, uh, with our uh, uh, satellites. However, the idea was clearly in, in Poincaré's mind in, in as early as 1909. And so what happens next is that uh, a few months later in Lille, there's a meeting of the uh, uh, Association uh, Française pour l'Avancement des Sciences, AFAS as we call it, uh, and Poincaré was invited to give a plenary lecture on 7th of August. And what does he do? He reinterprets the light ellipse. And how does he do this? He puts clocks in motion at this point. And so by putting the clocks in motion, he actually, what happens is he simply, well, at least on a space-time diagram, it's equivalent to use, uh, making a rotation of this ellipse. So now you have an ellipse that is a section, an oblique section of a cone, which everybody knows is an ellipse, right? So it actually works as long as you don't, as long as you use um, clocks in motion. We no longer have constant uh, time clocks for real time, we have constant time clocks for apparent time, or T prime. So a little of adjustment of using clocks in motion actually renders Poincaré's light ellipse uh, physically feasible. Now all, the, all these points on the ellipse lie on the light cone. That means they're physically accessible. Um, I'm going to move now to what happened to uh, how this how this involves then Poincaré's reinterpretation of the problem of space. All right, so now he's reinterpreted, he's accepted the idea that you can put clocks in motion, and and so you can have access to T prime directly uh, if you're in motion. Uh, he still has the notion that this, these values are only apparent and not real. However, they're physically real. All right, so you, it's it's a little bit uh, curious in that. He remains uh, attached to Galilee space-time, and yet he's interpreting these with respect to an ontology uh, that, is, uh, that is relativistic. 
point, uh, Minkowski, I said he's, he's dead, but uh, he publishes his, uh, his uh, famous uh, lecture, uh, Hamanzeit, in several languages, including French. It was published in, in France in, in 1909. Uh, uh, memorably, he began his lecture by saying uh, that the three-dimensional geometry becomes a, a chapter in four-dimensional physics. What he's referring to, of course, is that these constant time uh, hypersurfaces uh, are ortho orthogonal to any part particle's world line. So these are his chapters are hi constant time hypersurfaces orthogonal to uh, a, uh, an observer's world line. Poincaré, uh, Minkowski also insisted that this was not simply one possibility, and many, this is a view that was imposed upon us. Uh, this is uh, his, what I call his anti-conventionalist credo. Circumstances force changed ideas of space and time on us. Right, so this is obviously anti-conventionalist. Conventionalists would say that it's never forced. So we always have a choice. Uh, for Minkowski, there is no choice. These are uh, the um, results of experimental physics forces on us. Notably, he cited the null result of the Michelson-Morley ether, ether drift equation, and the second justification was that uh, the differential equation of what wave propagation of light in empty, empty space is Lorentz covariant. All right, so th for these two reasons, then, we're forced to accept the reality of what we call Minkowski space. Well, you can imagine that Poincaré didn't take that lying down. Uh, although Minkowski was dead, there's a response that, that Poincaré published in 1912. Uh, this is a lecture he gave in London uh, by invitation at the University of London, where he explained what he called at that point the principle of physical relativity. The principle of rel physical relativity he defined as uh, the reciprocal action of two very remote systems tends to zero as their distance increases indefinitely, such that two distant worlds behaves, behave as if they were independent. He goes, uh, this actually implies that uh, covariance of the covariance of the laws of mechanics, the covariance group of which would be taken as a definition of physical space and time. In other words, once you've chosen the covariance group of your mechanics, then uh, space and time are fixed. So uh, essentially in Poincaré's view at this point, you have a choice of Newtonian mechanics or uh, relativistic mechanics, and your choice will then dictate your space time. So uh, the, the choice is between two space times, or if you like, between two uh, covariance groups. For, it, for him, it's actually amounts to the same thing. Uh, and he insisted, Poincaré insisted, that this principle of physical relativity should be considered as a convention, right, in order to spare geometry from incessant <coughs> revision, which is something he'd always wanted to uh, avoid, uh, even in his earlier stance on the problem of space. Uh, this is the, the famous way he, he, he finished his, I put the both the English translation and the French original at the bottom here, for those of you that are reading in French. Nowadays, certain physicists want to adopt a new convention. He's speaking, of course, of uh, people like Einstein and Minkowski and Sommerfeld, Langevin. Not that they are obliged to do so, it's just they judge the new convention to be more convenient. That's all. Those who, who differ may legitimately keep their previous convention so as not to disturb their mature habits. This was indeed what Poincaré uh, felt he was going to do. So I've come to the end. Uh, let me just summarize here. So the idea is that Poincaré put, first put clocks in motion with respect to either in 1899. He attained agreement with electromagnetic phenomena to first order in B sub C. In my, uh, May of June 1905, Poincaré discovered the Lorentz group expressed the relativity of laws of physics. Uh, However, his theory of relativity did not extend at first to clocks in motion. He realized uh, around 1909 that wireless telemetry employing co-moving clocks with a precision increased by several orders of magnitude could reveal time deformation. He immediately adjusted his view of the locus of light, as we saw in the, in the little lecture. So my conjecture is that recognition of the reality of time deformation was a precondition for Poincaré's introduction of the notion of a space-time convention. I, I doubt very seriously w whether he would have done that if he had not actually come to this realization about the, uh, uh, that clocks in motion uh, could be accepted as valid timekeepers. The upshot here uh, is that, indeed, technical in advances, such as continuous wave wireless communication, fuel scientific spe speculation on the foundations of physics. This is, so this is, uh, this may be a hard one to swallow for those who are, uh, uh, I think that this is a, is a purely abstract realm, but clearly in this case, uh, for Poincaré, uh, the development of wireless technology uh, was uh, instrumental in his change of views about the reality of, uh, of time in moving, uh, in moving frames. 
So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, in your lecture, you didn't mention Einstein very much. It seemed to me that uh, these guys like Poincaré, Hilbertson, they do, did not really communicate too much with Einstein. It looks like they considered him as uh, some kind of illiterate physicist who could not grasp the deep meaning, uh, mathematical meaning of, of these uh, transformations. Is that so? Um, there, there's some truth in that. Uh, we have, from Minkowski's correspondence, we have some disparaging remarks about um, Einstein's uh, performance as a student because, as you, you know, Minkowski was uh, Einstein's professor of mechanics at the Zurich Polytechnic in uh, 1901, around 1902. Uh, however, in, by 1908, he had come to realize uh, that Einstein's reputation had become significant among uh, th theoretical physics, phys uh, physicists, and I think he respected that, at least in 1908. Uh, as for Hilbert, uh, I think he came to respect uh, also Einstein's view, but of course his, his understanding of relativity was largely uh, uh, derived from Minkowski. You have presented us nicely the historical point of uh, conventionalism of uh, Poincaré. Uh, my question would be in what extent or if at all uh, this uh, philosophical especially but also physical conventionalism could be uh, actual today, namely from the point of view that uh, later in the 30s for example there were, as, uh, there were essays to or to endeavors uh, from, as far as I know, from uh, the side of some people uh, like Milne and so on who wanted to review uh, Einstein's uh, uh, theory of relativity from the point of uh, revised uh, Newtonian physics. And um, uh, could it be actual something like conventionalism in space and time today? Or is it just a Poincaré a person or a figure who was, uh, um, was blown up by, by the uh, development of the history in science. Well, he is, of course, he is very important as a philosopher um, from the other points of view, but uh, I'm just, uh, I I'm interested in this view you presented it. How actual is the conventionalism today? I, I think it's actually quite actual. Um, I don't know how many theoretical physicists you could you find who actually would say, would hold their hands and say, I'm a uh, Poincarian conventionalist. However, there's a, there's a large group of philosophers of science and perhaps more than a few physicists who, uh, who ascribe to um, uh, structural realism, which is, is linked by, uh, by its founders to uh, Poincaré's conventionalism. So the idea that what is real is not uh, the particular uh, objects, but relations between uh, phenomenal objects. So in that sense, the philosophy is, is still, uh, I think uh, a going concern, uh, at least in the, in the guise of structural realism. Uh, however, the question is whether whether Poincaré's view of the principle of phys uh, physical relativity is uh, is a going concern. Uh, I I don't I think I think since general relativity, it's clear that there are more than two options, <laughs> and in that sense, yeah, the, 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 the I think that pretty much changed the changed the game, and that's something I should insist that Poincaré did not see that coming. Uh, However, Poincaré may have seen and probably saw coming um, uh, something like quantum mechanics. He, was, he, he had actually uh, looked closely at the, the uh, old quantum theory uh, and, uh, and may well have judged that um, a, a Galilean space-time would be just as useful, if not more so, than uh, a Minkowski space-time in working out this uh, new mechanics, quantum mechanics. That's a, that's a speculation, of course. Poincaré published some work on quantum mechanics. Yes. Uh, there are some other questions? No more questions. Yes. Uh, 
Poincaré, you mentioned more what Minkowski said about Einstein, but Poincaré uh, did not uh, speak much about the uh, work of Einstein in the article 1905. Uh, they met once in uh, Sole um, conference in 1911, uh, but he did not, su there was not much su success in their communication. Uh, you want to comment? Yeah, okay. So thank you very much <laughs> once more. So it's a pleasure to present my old friend, 